coming up on Garden Talk. I'm a big believer in making sure your minerals are up where they need to be. You know, we focus a lot on NPK, but really it's it's all the kind of micronutrients and minerals that really make the difference. You're better off just going out and getting some leaf litter. The diversity that's in some leaf litter from the forest floor is going to far out compete anything that you're buying from the store. The reason why a lot of people are having to re-inoculate and even say in the package, you know, you have to do this every month or every 90 days is because most people are growing in volumes of soil that are too small to sustain a proper soil food web. It's nice to do it in a way that's not only responsible because it's a regenerative practice, but in a lot of ways it's been proven that it is the best way to produce that type of medicine. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 88. In this episode, I interview James of Organic Cultivators. He runs a large-scale farm, and that's what we're going to get into in today's episode. He talks about how he does things on his farm and some best practices for farming on a large scale. If you gain value from these podcast episodes, please click the like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so you can be notified when I release new episodes. If you'd like to support even more, visit patreon.com slash mrgrowit. There are various rewards set up for those of you who support, and you can pledge any amount that you'd like. 100% of the money pledged through Patreon goes right back into the podcast. It helps keep this podcast going, so thank you so much for those of you who support. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. Switched it up a little bit there, eh? That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. The Grow Tank kits are incredible. You get their Ion Board LED Grow Light, their Grow Tent, which is currently the thickest on the market, their ventilation system, clip-on fan, and the Controller 69 to control it all. You also get their fabric pots, a trellis net, plant ties, and trimmers. Definitely a good price for all that you get in the kit. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about these Grow Tank kits. And you can use discount code Mr. Grow It if you're buying off their website, acinfinity.com. That discount code actually works for all AC Infinity items. Or discount code Mr. Grow It 15 if you're buying off Amazon. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with James from Organic Cultivators. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thanks for asking. Today, we're going to get into large-scale farming. So this topic has actually been requested by quite a few people because we haven't really covered it on this podcast yet. Most episodes really revolve around small operations such as home grows. So in this episode, let's focus on your experience in large-scale operations. But first, what I like to do with all the guests is an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, I've been gardening vegetables for probably 25 years or so. I was like a science experiment in elementary school. I don't remember what it was, but I had tomato seeds in a bag and they germinated and sprouted. And my teacher was like, you should go home and plant those. And it just like sparked a thing where it was like this amazing cool thing i could put a plant in the ground and grow it and i put my first garden in the worst place possible uh, up against a building that was not facing the south so um, it was mostly in the shadow the entire time Uh, but over the years i kind of just gradually uh, grew things bigger and started out as a lot of people do especially you know back when i was a kid uh, you know you bought miracle grow and uh, you use that to fertilize your garden and thought you were doing amazing wonderful things because that's what everybody did and then uh, I was 18 and I grew some medicinal plants in a closet I built a homemade NFT system and uh, grew plants with uh, good old Dynagro and uh, eventually used like the leftovers in my outdoor garden because you know it said i could and say it's nutrients so why not uh over time uh just kind of paying attention to what was going on around me made these logical leaps to moving away from that stuff and building composts um 
really doing like polycropping. I never really just separated plants. So uh, just kind of started mimicking nature and throwing like 20% of my harvest just right back onto the ground. Like literally go out there and pick stuff off the plants and drop it on the ground. And uh, I just kind of felt like, hey, this is what's happening naturally. So this is what should happen. And my garden just got better and better every year. And uh, yeah, and then eventually uh, in Michigan, uh, things ended up in a place to where we could um, grow medicinal plants without the fear of anyone coming in and getting in trouble. And uh, kind of started looking into, I, my intention was to do an NFT system again, but I figured uh, I wanted something a little faster and I grow my garden outside every year, so why not grow in some soil indoors? and uh, started googling you like what's the best soil to grow this plant and uh, stumbled onto the concept of the soil food web um, and Jeff Lowenfels and Lane Ingham and, and all these people and um, I stumbled into a couple other people that kind of sparked the whole no-till thing and really kind of being more hands-off and so all these practices I had been doing for like the last 20 years um, I had no idea any of the science behind it the nomenclature nothing at all uh, so kind of stumbling into this uh, just kind of broadened this whole huge picture for me and then I ended up in some Facebook groups and kind of there's a lot of drama in them so I started my own group which has kind of grown it's it's like 13,000 people in the group and uh, we focus on regenerative agriculture uh, we put our first conference on uh, this year in February in Sturbridge Massachusetts we put our second one on this next February and uh, it's been kind of a crazy journey finding natural farming and it, it led me to my fiance and moving to California and stumbling into large-scale uh, medicinal plant farming. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been quite a change from growing in a few tents in a basement to uh, growing 18,000 square feet outside. It's pretty wild. Wow, 18,000 square feet. That That is huge. Roughly, how many plants are you growing in that space? Uh, there are nine light depth hoops uh, that take up roughly uh, 9,000 square feet. Each one of those hoops gets around 300 plants uh, per run. Uh, so, you know, what's the 2,700 plants, I guess, uh, in the light depths. Um, and then the full term garden, uh, that kind of varies depending on how early the plants go in. Uh, this year we got a, a much later start because of weird weather out here. So we have many more plants in the space, kind of like hedgerows and much smaller. Um, so you see, you know, people walking around with plants that are at least as tall as them, uh, which is nice. Um, any taller than that, it's unmanageable. I would not want to be getting on a ladder and dealing with some of the monsters that people grow, which is a nice photo op. Uh, and Wendy and I are, are next year, we're going to grow a couple of them just so we can be like, you know, check these monsters out. But it, for management um, of the canopy, it's, you know, it's definitely not economical uh, for time at all. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot more smaller plants is probably the way to go when you're growing at scale for sure. I can imagine the difficulty the more difficult it gets with the bigger plants. Me, I'm just a small home grower. So I'm growing, uh, you know, mostly indoors. I do have some outdoor plants, but uh, mostly indoors grow tents, you know, and I do keep my plants pretty small. And, uh, you know, when I grow those bigger plants, what I call big, you know, five, six feet, <laughs> it's uh, certainly more work involved than it is smaller plants, you know, two, three feet. I got to imagine the tools and equipment are a lot different, right? So when you're outdoors in a large scale operation, what tools and equipment do you typically use? Uh, well, I mean, honestly, for us, it's not that much different. Uh, certainly not that much different from having, um, well, I mean, I guess it depends. If you're talking about moving from tents to a big uh, large scale operation, that's probably a lot of it is going to be a bit different. But um, if you've been doing any type of home vegetable gardening or anything like that, 
uh, what we do on our farm is very similar. Um, the, we do very minimal tillage. Basically, if we have to till, we will. There are certain situations where that's a necessity. Certainly, if you're opening up a new field or something like that, um, tilling makes sense. Um, get some amendments in there. Break up the the grass, and so you can actually plant into it. Um, but you know, this last year when we had to uh, rip some ground, like you know, rented a tiller. Uh, we have a tractor that we bought last year, but we don't have the funds to buy uh, attachments for it right now. So it was me walking behind a tiller, uh, tilling up some ground. Um, you know, again, we try to do that as minimally as possible uh, and really try to focus on things like cover crops and um, doing some silage tarping uh, after knocking down cover crop. Uh, to kind of break things down but this year the way things worked out it, we just were not able to do that uh, so you know we made a decision and it it really it kind of worked out it benefited us because we do do a cover crop so heavily um, and that ground was cover crop through the winter um, it seeded so when we tilled everything in there was a lot of biomass and it all just grew back um, so we basically didn't have to, to reseed because we tilled all that in and we were able to get some amendments in there too so um, that, that full term garden right now you walk out there there's purslane that's like a foot and a half high uh, and that's you know we literally chopped all that stuff down and, and tilled it in so it comes back pretty well Okay, so let me ask you this. We'll, we'll get into cover crops first, and then we'll kind of get back into kind of how you prepare the soil for planting. Because um, I assume that you're doing cover crops between grows. Is that right? And, and what do you typically do for cover crops? So out here, um, we buy like a fodder seed, basically. Um, it's a uh, it's what's available locally. Um, so there's like some fava beans and some vetch and stuff like that in there. Um, you know, the cover cropping we do is really like at the end of cycle. And then there's companion plants that are out there along with the plants if you want to get technical about what you're calling, you know, each thing. Um, and at the end of the year, we will plant different things and what we're companion planting with. Everything I just described, like the purslane, those are companion plants that were put out there. Um, and then our covers, depending on the situation, we'll use different things. Um, this is my, this will be my second winter in California. Uh, so my goal is to really try to uh, put out some different cover crops than were last year, which was kind of like, a variety depending on what the soil test reads so we may change up what we're doing um i know we're talking about planting um uh for making our own mulch next year because we weren't able to get any mulch this year everybody was contracted out so there are some considerations that we're trying to make um, outside of uh just nutritional but how much biomass um, is created by whatever we're planting out there because we got a fair amount of ground we need to cover um, and we don't necessarily want to do it with native grasses that seed really fast and uh, we don't want to deal with that um, but in between grows we basically just fallow everything we let it go let the plants ride out the winter come back knock everything down try to get some tarps on it let the sun bake everything and come back and you can literally just stick your hand in the ground um, unfortunately we weren't able to do that this year with the amount of rain that we had. How long does it take after you, you knock down the cover crop and you're saying you're, you're putting a, like a tarp over it? How long until you actually take that off and then start planting in? A few weeks, depending on the weather and how much sun there is. It can be a few weeks. Um, we got out to our planting started so late in the season that we had plants. The weather was there. So you know we just honestly got out there a little late this year and weren't able to to make it happen um, but ideally uh, given the amount of um, old light depth tarps um, that we have on hand you know it just makes sense to use that um, certainly over you know using you know tilling every year or something like that it really does destroy your uh, the micro life in your soil so 
So we try to avoid that. Got it. And then after you remove those tarps, are you doing anything to prepare the soil for planting? Like some people add in amendments, for example. Some people will inoculate with microbes, for example. Are you doing any sort of preparation prior to planting? So um, this year, what we did, uh, ideally, you'd want to get a soil test to kind of gauge where you're at. Um, I, we weren't, we did not do that this year. Um, so basically what we did is we, um, each bed got some rock dust. Um, it got some organic chicken manure. Uh, it got some, uh, some lime, uh, and, uh, some alfalfa meal. Uh, so we do do amendments between cycles. Uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, making sure your minerals are up where they need to be. Um, you know, we focus a lot on NPK, but really it's, it's all the kind of micronutrients and minerals that really make the difference. Uh, so I'm a big believer in get some rock dust out there every time. Um, you, you can do, uh, you know, a larger, um, application of rock dust, um, less times, depending on how much you're doing it, you could do an application of rock dust like once every 20 years. Um, as far as inoculations, um, in my home grows, I was doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, I was doing compost teas and playing with IMO and, uh, in the beginning was really heavy handed. I think a lot of us, when we get into growing, it's like, we want to play with everything. And it's such a responsive plant that, it, you know, it, it's satisfying. You really can see, um, changes when you're, when you're playing with things. Uh, the danger with that is even if you have a fair understanding of what you're trying to do uh, is being heavy handed and you can throw things out of balance. So for me, I was doing teas like every week and um, I know people do do teas every week. For me, I was adding too much to my teas and then throwing things out of balance. So you got to kind of be careful what you're when you're going and getting information online, who you're getting it from and kind of parse that with some common sense and understand that the system itself works pretty well on its own. Um, out on the farm, the inoculations that get done are IMOs. Um, and IMO hasn't been done for the last few years. So our plan is to do one for this next season, but essentially we're going out and collecting indigenous microorganisms from different biomes essentially and then propagating them out on piles of, of carbohydrates and carbon. Uh, and it, it is a, you know, it's a selection for bacterial, uh, or excuse me, for um, terrestrial yeast and fungi. Um, and there will be some different bacterias in there. But essentially, the way it's done um, is, it, you know, it's just a great collection of uh, microbes that you can bring to your farm for very little money as opposed to buying um, an inoculum from the store which you know they're usually you know it's four or five species it's very limited so you don't have diversity there not saying it can't help you certainly in an indoor grow if you, and, and if you're in a, a sterile soil or dirt essentially um, you know those inoculums can help you uh, definitely uh, but you're better off uh, many times just going out and getting some leaf litter. Um, the diversity that's in some leaf litter from the forest floor is going to far out compete anything that you're buying from the store. Um, keeping in mind and having an understanding that you're also bringing in other things into an indoor environment. That's not a complete soil food web. So you can have things run out of control. Um, a lot of people like seeing roly polies in their their grow uh, because they um, bind up heavy metals and you know they eat detritus. Uh, the problem is they they explode out of control. So a lot of um, living soil growers are now having problems with roly polies and bringing uh, leaf litter into your grow. Um, while it can be a great idea, can also cause you some problems. So some of these things you kind of need to understand that there's a balance here and um indoor and outdoor like in my indoor i always had a low level thrips issue um, about six months in i had thrips enter my grow they're not that bad apply some beneficials i did some sprays here and there but i had a, a clover cover they love that stuff and they live everywhere they live in the plant tissue they're very hard to get rid of uh so 
I just kind of dealt with them and, and survived with them. Um, outdoors, you know, in, on the farm and even in my vegetable grow, I just let pests go. Generally, if I saw a pest enter the garden, they weren't there very long. Um, I had aphids come and attack my milkweed every year uh, in Michigan, and within a week or two, they were gone. They never became a problem because I had a diverse uh, population of plants on my property and kept everything pretty healthy because I wasn't spraying a bunch of stuff on it all the time. You mentioned balance a few different times, and I want to kind of focus in on this for a little bit, specifically the balance of nutrition in the soil. So you mentioned that you're, you're typically doing a soil test and then you're finding the, the balance is off. So you're amending in there. I think there's a lot of folks that grow organic or no-till, regenerative, and they hear that the plant uptakes nutrients as needed. And it's a common misconception that things can't get out of balance because of that. Can you talk to us about like how important it is to stay in balance and what damage can actually be done if you're out of balance? Yeah, and I, I will uh, say all of this with the caveat that I'm not a soil scientist. Um, I count myself as someone who's very good at collecting people who are wildly more intelligent than I am and know um, a lot more about this stuff than I do. Um, they help me run my group. Uh, so I defer to them on a lot of this stuff. Um, I will say that in my experience, um, depending on the size of your uh, vesicle that you're growing in, uh, much like a fish tank, it has more buffering capacity, so there's more room for error. You can throw a lot of things at it for much longer without throwing it out of balance. Um, I think, again, for me, I think if you start off with a base, if you have a, an, an understanding of um, how the different nutrients work together, and I don't have a great understanding of that. Um, soil science is extremely complicated. I'm reading books all the time when I have the time, but um, there's a lot of nuance in this and the science is just barely being scratched at. Um, I will say that, you know, there are some important things we understand about uh, mineral balance and how cations work. Um, and if you have certain things super out of balance, then nutrients won't uptake. Um, and there's part of the problem is we look at this as a chemistry thing. So it's like, you know, nutrients in a certain pH are available. And that is very true. Um, but, you know, the biology is so important in all of this. So I think really if you create a environment that's hospitable to a, di a diverse biology um, and you don't mess with them too much, they can balance a lot of things. Um, but again, you know, if you're, I think the, a, a lot of problems come with people think they're or growing organically and they're using bottled nutrients. Um, there's a lot of soluble uh, nutrients in those bottles and that can throw things off of balance um, a lot faster than if you're overdoing it on some dry amendments. Um, it's, it's a little bit harder to overdo it that way. Um, but people do it all the time. Uh, so, you know, at, for me, I started out with like a clats coots mix with basically with it negating the knee meal because um, I couldn't get it locally and people are kind of weird about it. So I just didn't use it. And uh, I've just kind of grew the soil from there. Um, I think if you really want to look into like soil science and the numbers and balancing things um, behind soil testing, uh, you should look into um, Dan Kittridge's talks on YouTube. Um, he's actually one of the speakers at the conference. He's able to break things down in a way that kids understand it. Uh, so, you know, explaining how, what pH actually is and how it functions and, and what it means, looking at it as a fuel tank as opposed to just a number that makes a nutrient available. Um, so, so, yeah, I think looking, the ideas that he presents are largely from, um, on the soil science aspect, the testing, uh, John, or not John Kemp, uh, Albrecht, and, um, so there are some specific numbers 
uh, on the mineral side of things that have kind of been uh, collectively decided upon by Albrecht students. They've kind of all come together and decided what these optimal numbers are. Um, and there, there are some slides on his talks on YouTube that he kind of like lays it all out. So if you're someone who has a hard time deep diving into the books uh, that can be kind of long-winded and complicated, there are some, some cheats out there that you can go and find these people um, and, and get into that aspect of it. Outside of that, um, I think keep it simple is probably the best advice and the best path forward. If you're doing um, a worm casting tea once a month, you're probably killing it at, you know, like that is a really easy maintenance thing to do uh, for your indoor as a maintenance tea for uh, biology. I'm not really familiar with those sources. I'll have to check them out. There's so much good information out there. You mentioned that the when it comes to soil science, it's so complex. It really is. And we're just scratching the surface. Like you said, like there's a lot of things we do not know about this. And uh, it's exciting to me, the things that we're unra are unraveling as we continue to go on. So, so yeah, I'll definitely check out those sources. Let's uh, let's flip it up. Let's talk about mulch layers. So uh, from my understanding, you do use mulch layers, large scale. It can certainly be different than smaller scales. So talk to us about mulch layers. Yeah, I mean, in my indoor, I grew all kinds of stuff in my bed and would just smash it down and use it as mulch, you know, Swiss chard, <laughs> like just stuff for biomass, essentially. Um, in the On the farm, we try to use uh, alfalfa straw as much as we can. But um, like I said, this year, we weren't able to get any of it. It's all been contracted. Um you know, anything that you can get on your soil to cover it up so it's not bare uh, is probably a good thing outside of a bunch of, you know, grass seeds that you don't want to deal with later on down the line. Um, yeah, it, you know, nature really you know doesn't like bare soil. The microbes have a real hard time existing in an environment that's just being baked by UV rays. Um, and dried out and generally if soil's not covered up it dries out really fast um, we try to add a mulch that has some nutritional aspect to it uh, as hence the alfalfa uh, but if you don't have that even like a third or fourth cutting hay uh, you know get it on there and cover it up I, I, you're going to be doing much better um, certainly you know if you can't uh, you know use cover crops uh, in the winter or, you know, for whatever reason, a layer of, you know, eight to 10 inches of mulch, you'd be surprised at how much that does um, to improve um, soil aeration and soil health over a winter. Like you come back and there's a good amount of topsoil there that's nice and loose and arable. So definitely beneficial. Eight to 10 inches, huh? That seems kind of thick. Is that typical for outdoors oh that's what we put on that's what we put on our beds uh for our plants on the farm a nice thick layer of mulch and you know before harvest it's gone it's it's generally mostly gone interesting yeah i usually just do it indoors i mean completely different right but uh you know two inches roughly is what i do but uh, maybe i need to thicken it up a little bit it'd probably be beneficial especially if i'm using something that's going to break down and be nutrients for the plant so well, that's what I was going to ask you. How how long before you have to replenish your mulch? Uh, you know, typically lasts most of the grow. You know, I'm in a very dry climate. I live in the desert. And so the water retention in the soil, keeping that top layer moist is difficult for me. So adding in that mulch layer is, is very beneficial, but it can last pretty much the entire grow. How big is your, uh, are you growing in a pot or a, a bed? I've been doing seven gallon pots. Okay. So, um, do you have a microscope? I do not. Okay. So I will tell you that the single best investment in a tool that I ever made, um, for growing was a microscope. Um, we like to think that we're growing in living soil, uh, in small pots because we're doing all of, um, these practices that really, 
um, are beneficial to building and maintaining a living soil. Unfortunately, when you're in that small of a volume, um, it's, it doesn't have that buffering capacity that we we're talking about. It doesn't have the ability to sustain moisture um, the way that you would like to. And it's just not enough volume for life to sustain itself in a cycle without you consistent, continually having to add more life to it. So when you see that when you buy something from the store, um, like an inoculum, there's two facets to this. One is that it's a lab grown microbe. So they're kind of weaker, but they should propagate and live in an environment um, and, and keep breeding and living and reproducing as long as they have food and the conditions are right. So the reason why a lot of people are having to re-inoculate or even say on the package, you know, you have to do this every month or every 90 days um, is because most people are growing in volumes of soil that are too small to sustain a proper soil food web. Um, there has, I don't, I'll have to ask uh, Wendy what the guy's name was, but there has been um, some limited research done that shows that about 60 to 65 gallons of soil is the minimum you want to have a self-cycling, self-sustaining living soil that you're not constantly having to add things to. My suspicion is that your mulch is lasting so long because you don't have the amount of microbiology that would be sufficient to actually break it down. Um, and that in turn, you probably, you would see an increase in your cannabinoid and terpene levels if you got into a larger volume of soil because you would have that diversity in microbiology and that would create a more complex cannabinoid and terpene profile. Um, the reason why our mulch doesn't last very long out on the farm is because the microbiology out there kills it. You can literally lift up clumps of dirt that have fungi running through them. Um, and we have, like I said, we haven't inoculated. Um, I don't think Wendy's put IMO out there. This will be the fourth season. So it's been four years since she's made an IMO application. Um, it's a, a testament to, um, you know, the microbes being hardy uh, and the environment being such that, you know, once there's water out there, uh, they just go off. You know, so, and that's the other thing too is, you know, people have this, and again, not a soil scientist, but people have this misnomer about um, microbiology like dying off when things get dry. I mean, sure, but they, you know, mostly they go dormant. Um, and the, it can take a long time for them to come back. So, you know, outdoors um, where they, the, biology goes deep, um, the soil can get pretty dry um, in areas out there. And then once we have water out there, the, the plants just, they kill it. And you can see the activity. You can see the fungi coming back, plumping up. Um, it never disappeared. It was always there. It just kind of dried out and went dormant. Um, indoors, when your pot dries out and everything goes dormant, it takes a long time for it to wake up because it's all gone dormant and then again you're having to re-inoculate so the, there are all these things that when you're in a small pot um, fighting all these forces um, they stack up and it makes it harder for you to maintain so i like i said i, I think if you get into a bigger volume you and um, focus on getting uh, more diversity in there you'll probably notice your mulch going away faster and if you get a microscope and you scope your seven gallon pot compared to like a good living soil, I think you're going to be surprised at how little is actually happening in there. Because I thought I was killing it in my bed. And then I got a microscope and I was like, wow, there's almost nothing happening here. And I could see the effects of it starting to happen in the plant. Uh, but I still thought I was doing such a great job. Um, so once, and the other aspect of that is, I don't know if you do teas at all, uh, compost teas, but I was doing compost teas a lot and just going off of recipes and times, you know, you put this in the tea and you boil, you know, you run it for 36 hours, uh, until you have a microscope and you're actually looking at the tea itself, you have no idea what you've grown in there. Uh, and you're not going to know all the names of everything because 
that's impossible. No one does. Uh, but you can definitely look in there and see, you know, do I have bacteria in there? Is it full of just a bunch of E. coli? Uh, you know, do I have some higher order organisms? Have I brewed it to a point where it's nothing but those higher order protozoa and they've consumed all the bacteria and all the oxygen? Depending on the type of tea that you're going for, that might be a great thing. If your soil is completely dead, you know, some protozoa, not a bad thing. Um, an anaerobic tea, it's not the worst thing. It's not the greatest thing. There are anaerobes that live in your soil. So, like, there are all these taboo things. You don't want to put a super anaerobic stinky tea on your soil. Don't get me wrong. Um, but um, there are some some words like anaerobes where people are like, yeah, it can't be anaerobic. It can't whatever. You know, there are facultative anaerobes. There are things like um, lactobacilli, which, you know, are definitely facultative anaerobes. And they're good. They're in your gut. They're, they're all over the place. We use them to, to clean with. So, Got it. Yeah, time and time again, organic farmers have mentioned that I uh, should be using a larger container. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. some people are trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to run organics in three gallons, five gallons, because it's easier to move that around. But I mean, you bring up some fantastic points. And I've heard it before. I'm slowly working towards larger containers. It's only a matter of time before I'm in a bed running organics and uh, potentially, you know, getting to the point where I don't have to till it all. But I'm a little bit of ways there. I would say I'll tell you when you make the switch to your bed, the biggest learning curve, uh, I would tell everyone this when they're switching to beds, is watering. That'll be your biggest learning curve is how to water that bed properly without overwatering it or underdoing it. And so my, my biggest piece of advice to you is when you build your bed and you're putting soil in it, water your soil in layers as you're building it. So you make sure your bed is watered sufficiently from top to bottom the first time you put your soil in there. Because if you fill that with dry soil and then you start to water that, you will have hydrophobic pockets in that that you are battling forever. So um, I, I can't stress enough, uh, you know, water that as you're putting it in. Yeah, it's a really good tip for sure. So talking on a large scale um, fertilizer. You know, you have the plants growing. You already mentioned what you do for cover crops, mulch layer, how you prepare the soil to begin. You've planted those plants in there and they start to grow. At what point do you fertilize and what do you use for a fertilizer? So it really depends on, you know, and in, in the outdoor, we're really kind of keeping an eye on the plants. Um, when we're able to be out there on a regular basis and for this next year, we're trying to set it up so we have somebody out there on a more regular basis uh, we have five kids we don't live on our farm our farm is about 45 minutes away from the homestead so just to get out there it's a trip um, but in an ideal world we would be doing a weekly maintenance spray uh, which is a korean natural farming uh, concoction of some knf inputs uh, it's a, a fermented plant juice um, an oriental or oriental herbal nutrient which is um, a tincture with vodka and um, a, a brown rice vinegar or a, a live vinegar um, and and that's um, sprayed as like a weekly maintenance which is basically a, a super minor plant food which has all different types of micro and macro nutrients in it um, some of the fpjs that we've seen um, the uh, nutrient test results on have been really interesting. There's there's a, a wide variation of nutrients in there, uh, but they're all at very, you know, it's all one to 1,000, one to 500, so it's not very much. Uh, the nice thing about all of the KNF inputs is they're they're edible. You can take them. A lot of people take them for human health, but you certainly don't have to worry about them hurting you uh, because you can eat them. Uh, so it'd be like a weekly spray of that and then there are some other inputs um, if you needed some calcium and some phosphorus you could add some calphos which is essentially some some charred bones that are then soaked in vinegar um, really you know ideally you have all of the nutrients and everything you need in the ground uh, at the beginning of the year you've kind of you've set your you know you filled your fuel tank up essentially um, and then we have all of these tools that we can use to kind of top it off when we need to. Um, but, you know, last year we weren't able to do anything. 
uh, as far as K and F maintenance sprays really, um, at, th at the end of the year, uh, we didn't do anything to our full term. It was, you know, water only. Um, and again, that is a, a testament to the microbiology that, that is out there. Um, a lot of people would say the terroir, and I, I think there probably is something to that as well. Um, as far as the end product goes, um, but yeah, so we'd be doing like maintenance sprays and then, you know, topping it off with the occasional addition to those sprays. Sometimes we will fertigate with those same uh, concoctions, those same inputs, um, all at the same rate. You're just using more of it because you're soaking it into the ground as opposed to foliar feeding. Um, once we get towards the end of the cycle, uh, we don't really like spraying stuff on the plants, so we move away from that. And then... Certainly, if you're doing something like a liquid IMO, which is the IMO in kind of a compost tea form, uh, you definitely don't want to be spraying that uh, on flowers uh, because you can fail microbial testing and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, essentially, we're pretty hands off and, and mostly, you know, setting ourselves up at the beginning of the year, really taking care of the microbiology making sure we have, you know, a diverse set of plants out there. We always have flowers and different kind of wild plants. And, you know, given that it's it's me and my fiance and her, you know, 70-year-old mom, uh, you know, we, we're pretty limited on how much we can be out there. Uh, but the fact that, uh, you know, the end product consistently won awards and... Uh, you know, people definitely really enjoy it. I, uh, you know, it works out pretty well. So I'm, I'm a firm believer of the, you know, keeping it simple, kind of trying to stay hands off. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, working in concert with nature, understanding that not everything is going to go your way. You're not going to be able to control everything. And that's probably a good thing. I think the best thing about, uh, the plant that we're talking about is that um, it's a gateway plant. It, everybody wants to grow everything after they start growing it. Um, I hardly know anyone that started growing it that hasn't moved to other things. Um, it was the reverse for me. I, I liked growing plants, period. So um, it's just a really fun plant to grow, and it brings a lot of joy to people and, and healing. So it's nice to do it in a way that's not only responsible uh, because it's it's a regenerative practice um, but you know I think it in a lot of ways it's been proven that it is the best way to produce that type of medicine so you're almost entirely doing natural farming techniques besides that rock phosphate for example that you mentioned for the initial amending or the initial amendments that you put in prior to planting you're doing natural farming techniques now let me ask you prior to implementing these natural farming techniques was your farm using chemicals at all or did you always just start with the natural farming yeah well, uh wendy on their farm uh I'm trying to think. I think, you know, back in the day, like a long time ago, uh, when her parents were growing and she was growing up and that kind of stuff, they were definitely um, using some uh, chemical nutrients here and there. But I think everybody was back in the day. Um, I will say that when everything went legal here and everyone was freaking out, uh, Wendy was confused why. And then everyone started failing testing. And she was like, oh, because everyone uses like crazy chemicals um, and they don't. Um, I think at, you know, early on, they made the switch from anything that was a synthetic nutrient to organic because that's how they were growing their food. So it didn't make sense to keep doing it like that. Um, I know, you know, as far as K and F, that farm has been running, you know, K and F inputs for six years now, uh, where it's, you know, they're, it's just, you know, us making inputs and then applying them. Uh, you know, as I said before, when I started out growing, I was definitely using miracle Grow and, um, hydroponic, whatever, uh, that was out there and, 
it, you know, it was a few shops in Michigan that had that stuff because it wasn't like every corner store like it is now. There was like one spot you had to drive an hour and a half to and, and get your nutrients for your tomatoes that you're growing and, uh, you know, do it like that. Um, you know, I don't fault anyone who's using that stuff. I mean, the thing is, a lot of people just don't have a deeper understanding of soil science because a lot of it's so new and it is just permeating the culture and um you know there are all these new hot button things that you know regenerative and organic and um you know unfortunately all these labels kind of get co-opted and people you know twist things around and then there ends up being negative connotations to them that's part of the reason why I'm trying to talk to so many people in different camps. You know, the, the permaculture people don't necessarily hang out with the biodynamic people. They don't necessarily hang out with just the organic dudes who are buying bottles of whatever. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that really believe in, in that, you know, bottle of magic or whatever that they're buying from the store. Like, it's the best stuff. Unfortunately, at large scale, you, it's you know, it's far too expensive. You can't grow at large scale by buying bottles of nutrients. And I'll tell you right now that, um, you know, some of the farmers that are, um, you know, hyping these expensive nutrient lines out there, uh, you know, they're, they're not hyping them because they're buying them and they work so great. They're hyping them because they're paid money and they were given to them. They would never buy those because they can't afford them at large scale. It's the same reason why nutrient companies go all around the world and get farmers hooked on fertilizer and teach them how to grow with their fertilizer and then basically make them indentured slaves for the rest of their life because it's the only way they know how to grow and they have to buy these nutrients from the companies that have come in. That's part of the reason why we're trying to set up our nonprofit is to show people that they can make nutrients from the things around them in nature uh, and, and, you know, kind of get off that teat. Um, And I'll tell you that uh, people who are fighting really hard in the regenerative space and natural farming, um, you know, those are people that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're rebels. I'll, you know, they're, they're the people on the front line who, when this really starts to threaten, uh, fertilizer companies, um, you know, they're the ones who are going to take the brunt of the hit. So it's really important that we all connect and not in fight and come together because, you know, we have much more power uh, coming together as one big loud voice as we do a bunch of small camps that are infighting with each other. And we're all banging the same drum, but we're beat, banging it at a different beat. And we all got to get on the same beat. Um, so that's kind of what my goal has been is to get everybody talking about the same thing. And, uh, you know, right now is a great time because. With uh, everything going on, fertilizer costs are super high or you can't even get it. So uh, a lot of farmers are making the switch to organic practices, uh, but they're going to fail. They're going to fail a lot because their land is screwed up uh, and it takes time to repair that. Um, It doesn't take a lot of time. It can actually take a very short amount of time if you do it properly. Um, But there are... Um, There are a lot of people that are going to make mistakes and they need help and they shouldn't be ostracized because they've been growing with chemical nutrients this whole time. That's what they were taught. Um, You know, you can't fault them for that. Um, I think it's foolish to try to fight with the big ag companies because you're never going to win and they're not going anywhere. I think our main goal needs to be to show them how this is the best way. For one thing, farmers um, can save a lot of money uh, by switching to natural farming. Well, you're certainly going to save money on inputs. Your labor is going to go up a bit. Uh, but in the end, uh, once the consumer is fully educated on what nutrient density is and why it is important, uh, how you grow your crops and medicine is going to become instrumental and it will drive the price of commodities as opposed to there just being a flat price. Right now, basically, unless you're in a farmer's market, a tomato is the cost of a tomato. Um, you know, but they're there can be um, incentive there for farmers to grow the best 
produce possible as opposed to the most produce. Um, and it is a shift that's happening. Um, and it's interesting to see. Got it. Yeah, I was just curious about that one going from chemical nutrients to natural farming, what the time savings would be versus the, the cost savings, the difference in product and all that stuff. I'll tell you that, you know, if you're, you know, buying anything in a bottle, you are mostly paying for water um, and you're paying for it to be shipped to you. Uh, so, you know, the cost for Sunavis to switch from um, its regular, you know, buying um, fertilizer uh, and amending and, and all of its other practices, um, she was spending $2 an acre um, going from $2 an acre to $0.20 cents an acre. So you're talking about 10% of the input cost um, than than what it was um, so again like your input cost will go down but you are going to go up in labor a little bit because it takes time to make this stuff but you know if you get a group of people together at the beginning of the year you can smash out your inputs for the whole year in a couple of days so you're making all your inputs in a couple of days and then there's the added labor of applying like maintenance sprays to your plants or whatever but depending on your setup if you're a large-scale farm and you have a tractor certainly you have a sprayer for the back of that tractor so you hook your sprayer up and you put your maintenance spray in there and you drive up and down the rows and it sprays the spray on your plants and you're done so i i know that you know there are people who you know do a whole orchard in an hour or less uh they just drive up and down the rows and they spray and their orchards do that all the time anyway they're spraying all kinds of chemicals on those trees so you just switch over to the KNF input or whatever other thing you're using that's a natural farming input uh, and you're not really increasing your labor costs there because you're already spraying other chemicals so really in those situations it's a huge cost savings because you have dropped your inputs down so much I will say that you know there are there's lots of different natural farming stuff out there and you know there's KNF and there's Jadam and there's other practices not all of them are interchangeable and they have different applications there's not a whole lot in the way of pest control in Korean natural farming but there is in Jadam so yeah significant cost savings which is what i assumed and what i've heard so uh, that that's really good to know okay a few more questions for you one of them i like to ask towards the end of every episode, which is really advice for beginners. You know, there are people listening in here that are transitioning to a large scale operation, or maybe they just started working in a large scale operation. What tips do you have for those that are making that transition? Oh, a laundry list. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that um, if you're moving into the industry as a whole, not even just as a grower, um, it's probably going to dishearten you a little bit. Um, there aren't much ethics involved yet um, because there isn't a whole lot of uh, in the way of legal recourse. Um, so uh, j just a, a word of caution there. Um, as far as people uh, moving into growing or learning about how to grow, um, I, I would say be very careful of where you're getting information from. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who pretend to be experts in everything. Uh, and I, I will tell you that the Cougar-Dunning syndrome is a real thing. Um, you know, uh, people often before they, people think they know more than they know. Um, anyone who is claiming to be a master grower, you should probably be wary of them. Um, you Use common sense. Uh, whenever someone is trying to tell you something, try to think about, does this apply in the natural world? Um, there, like, there's a lot of tinkering that goes on and that's fine. Uh, but really keep it simple. Um, there are some great learning resources out there. Uh, some of them, even though they're great learning resources, have the tendency to push some, what we would consider bro science, uh, and it's, it may only be bro science because it hasn't been uh, proven out in a way that can be peer reviewed. 
So you need to be careful when you're listening to people who do have authority and a lot of followers and understand that unless you can find this information in white papers, online, um, scholarly articles that have been published, then this is just conjecture on someone's part. Um, I'm a big fan of people saying, I don't know. Uh, so anyone who can be upfront and honest about their limitations and their knowledge, that's huge. Uh, you want to listen to those people. Um, that's probably the best advice I can give is be careful of who you are getting advice from. Um, reach out to people who are trusted uh, and have been around for a long time and ask their advice. Uh, you know, feel it out a bit before you just go down a rabbit hole of adding a bunch of stuff to your grow and then you've killed all of your plants. Um, that would be my second piece of advice is trial everything out. Do side-by-sides. Don't assume that because you applied something to your grow and you killed it, that that thing was the determining factor. Did you apply five other things that you hadn't done before? Did you do a side-by-side -side with a control group? If you did not do that, you have no idea that what you have done has been beneficial or negative to you in any way. So if you're moving into this space and you want to learn the best way possible and you are going to tinker, make sure you're doing side-by-sides. Make sure you're keeping a track of what you're doing. Because in our group, if you say something, you need to be able to back it up. And it doesn't have to be something that is out there for the whole world, a published study, but have some data. We like to debate things. We like to talk about what people have done. But if you don't do that work and you just have a claim, you don't really know. You have no idea what you did, did anything for you at all. Solid advice. Obviously do your due diligence. Try to find those research papers if they're out there. And um, yeah, sharing, sharing is caring. James, uh, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, well, you can always find us on Facebook in the Organic Cultivators Facebook group. Uh, it is, you know, you got to work to get in there. There's some questions to answer. We don't, we don't want to do the work for you. You know, you got to do some work for yourself. So if you can't at least Google to answer some questions, you know, you're probably going to be somebody that takes too much time. Um, there's a lot of people in the group, uh, the people that you know, uh, some bigger names in the industry, so to speak, and they all help out in the group, which is kind of cool. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Organic Cultivators, and we're going to have our next conference in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, February 17th, 18th, and 19th. And uh, the 20th will be a special workshop day with Suzanne Wainwright. Uh, so yeah, come check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have Dan Kittredge there and Dr. James White from Rutgers. If you guys know who he is, he's done some amazing work on the rhizophagy cycle. So we're going to have him come out and talk and Suzanne Wainwright will be there. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Organiccultivators.net. Awesome. I'll definitely have a link to uh, at least your Instagram down in the YouTube description section below. And then, of course, if you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, just search for him. He'll show up. James, thanks again for coming on. This is a great talk. I uh, definitely learned a few things, and I think it's going to bring a lot of value to my audience. So thank you for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks. It was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was good to meet you, and uh, hope to see you at the conference. Absolutely. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.